Good afternoon. It is an absolute privilege to be a part of the Voices United ACDA conference this year. My name is Dr. John Martin Petzett, Director of Choral Activities at the University of Nebraska at Kearney. So welcome to the choral warm-up, Cracking the Code. So I like to start with a typical warm-up that I would do. So can we begin with just a three-note scale? We just kind of hum. something more staccato, more percussive. So we might do something like this. for your choir. And then next I like to do some canons. You can do it on numbers, you can do it on solfege, you can do it on neutral syllable, but canons are so good for our singers. four parts going great but two or three is fine whatever works for your kids your your folks and then finally again I like to end with something rousing so higher 
as low as your choir should do. That was about four and a half, five minutes. Um, that, that's an example of, of something I would do. I, I, I like to place a lot of variety in these warm-ups. I'll get to the why later, but one of the whys actually is that there's different, every day is not the same. And so sometimes we, um, sometimes we just want to get the voices going and we kind of have to rely on our old standards. But then other times, uh, there might be a particular musical skill we're trying to work on with the choir, and that can become a warm-up. So maybe our choirs aren't crescendoing very well. Maybe dynamics is an issue. So I would just give them something as simple as a neutral pitch, G natural, and give them four beats, and you conduct as the conductor while they crescendo gradually over four beats. And you can even get their hands involved in doing something like this or stretching taffy. But you conduct normal, and they just give them a vowel, oh, and just have them go, oh, give them a release. <coughs> whatever, whatever it takes, you can stretch it out to eight beats, four beats, 12 beats, any dynamic from one to the other. Um, make it whatever you want. But a particular skill. Uh, number two, there might be something related to the repertoire. Maybe the repertoire you're working on right now has chromatic lines in it, and they're just not singing the half steps very evenly. So you could teach them a unison chromatic scale, just up five notes. And then once they have that really solid, uh, and then you can have them go backwards and tune those intervals. And they love the competition. They love the challenge of it. So, so ask them to do it. Um, Maybe the choir just got off of contest. Uh, maybe they're going to contest in two and a half weeks. Uh, that is certainly not the time to introduce new warm-ups. Um, so you might want to stick to your old standbys for the three weeks before a contest. Um, maybe they just got back from contest the day before. Probably not the day for a new warm-up. Probably need to just stick to your old standbys and, um, and then get to your announcements and your rehearsal whatever you need to do. Um, we need to train them to, to decode our conducting gestures. So sometimes uh, I have an exercise that I do that just makes percussive sounds. Um, and it just, it just uses quarter notes and it goes p, t, k, rest, f, s, sh, and it starts over. And then I, I play around with it. So I'll go and of course they'll go on because they're not watching. And so I remind them, and they pick it up really quickly. And then I'll go, f -s 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 -s. and you can play around with crescendo, de crescendo, staccato, tempo, all day long. And it gets them. I use it for honor choirs because it gets them focused in. So this is just a list of of reasons why you know. Reasons why we do warm-ups certain ways or ways to link warm-ups to ensemble needs. And watching the conductor is one of them. They must watch the conductor. Okay, uh, maybe you've got a violinist coming in 15 minutes into your rehearsal. Uh, again, not a day for new warm-ups. Don't get bogged down. Do, your, do three warm-ups. Get them done in four or five minutes. And get ready for this violinist so that you treat them like a professional. So every day is a little different. I went to Webster's Dictionary, what is a warm-up? Webster says the warm-up is the actor instance of warming up. Thank you, Webster. That was not particularly helpful. But we know from our normal lives that when we run or exercise, we tend to loosen up the muscles first. When we play tennis, we, we stretch our legs out. Um, when we uh, go to the health club, of course, uh, we probably do a little bit of stretching first. Uh, we have hors d'oeuvres before the meal. So all of these analogies can work and, and use them to explain to your students that this is why we do this. This isn't just to be cute or to do something to be silly. This is a, a, an important part of singing and the rehearsal process. Uh, we have to prepare the body, the mind, and the voice for singing. Um, and there's all, again, all these musical issues that can be uh, addressed in the warm-up. Um, Blend, balance, ensemble, posture, 
breath support, resonance, range extension, agility, diction, expression, oral acuity, um, all these things can be addressed. So during the warm-up, uh, we talk about three areas, energizing the body, the breath, the ear, and the voice, actually four areas. So let's start with the body. Singers bring a lot of stress from the day. Uh, maybe the donut shop was out of maple long johns, that's my personal favorite. Um, maybe somebody has lost a loved one. Uh, we bring in all kinds of baggage and stress. And so when we explain to our singers this simple fact, then we can do some physical warm-ups and things to get rid of that stress. Um, the classic warm-up uh, sort of is the massage. Uh, it's sort of falling out of popularity, but um, if your singers still like to do that, uh, then have them turn to the left, massage, turn to the right, massage. Um, but there are some other examples too. For instance, um, I do one where I stand up and I, over 15 seconds, and I count to 15, we move to a squatting position, and then I'll have them put their hands on their abdomen, and we'll do maybe four F sounds. So we'll go, and then I'll do eight, and then I'll do 12. And I try to get them to fill the pulsations down here. Of course, I talk about the low breath, the deep breath, um, and then I'll have them put their hands on their intercostal muscles back here so they can feel the expansion when they take the breath. And of course, just squatting down, they can feel this a little bit uh, more of a, in a physical way. And so all of this just gets them in touch with, let's try to make it what it feels like in a squatting position. Do it, make it feel like that when you're standing up. Just feeling all of this expansion and, and bringing the air in and then singing, you know, I don't want to say forcing it out, but using your air in a um, efficient way. So that's one example. Um, and then when we're done with the squatting position, we slowly, I count to 15, and we slowly raise back up. And then as we get back to the standing position, the arms go all the way up, and it just gives a sense of completion to the exercise. Um, of course, you can do all kinds of random stretches um, with, you know, your legs or your give yourself a hug or you can get the blood moving to your your arm. Simon Carrington used to do that with his face. Um, th th there's a million variations on that theme. Um, th there, sometimes uh, I have the students model me one or two beats behind me and so they're always behind me so they can react and then I'll switch and do some things and, and it, it's kind of fun but it also wakes them up it's not just standing and singing um, and so there's a million ways to take that um, let's see pull an imaginary thread we've all done the Alexander technique where you pull the imaginary thread um, up through the spine like you're dangling like a marionette and then you you pull this and it just kind of centers the body and and gets everything almost in a levi levitating way and centers it and brings it up and gets it nice and buoyant. Um, it's almost like the string is set at the base of the spine. Almost like some of these character Christmas ornaments, you know, you, you pull the spine up and the whole body just lifts. Lift, that's such a good word to use for singing. Um, and uh, the body becomes tall and erect and expanded. And that's what we want. We want our singers um, to hold this composure and to not be tense during singing. You know, when you're holding that folder for an hour, it just brings everything down. And the more that we can talk about this and explain it to them, they'll know why we're doing. I think the days are gone where you just say, "What I do, do what I say because I'm the boss. I think it's better to teach them why we're doing it. And so that's the way I approach this. And then the ballerina, of course. You, um, you bring your hands up, standing up, of course. I don't want to jump out of the picture frame uh, for this recording. But you bring your arms all the way up, so you relax. I'm sorry, let me start over this one. This is called the ballerina. And you put your hands all the way down, standing up, of course. And then you slowly bring your hands up, very slowly. And as, of course, as you do this, I explain to the singers that everything up here is becoming tall and anchored and erect. And then, once they get up here, I let them bring the arms down slowly. But I ask them to keep all of this nice and tall and supported and then I tell them this is the singer's posture 
and I remind them it's not supposed to be awkward or robotic or tight, but we just want to be tall and supported. We want to support the voice with our body. And so that's, that, that works pretty well. Okay, we talk about energizing the breath. And of course, there's kind of three areas of breath we talk about. Uh, breathing deep, breath control. Um, you know, obviously on the breathe deep, deep breath, we don't want to, you know, you've seen a kid's fan at the concerts. We don't want to breathe too deep. We don't want to faint. But we do want, we're after that low breath, that expansion of the abdomen, filling this up and always having the shoulder blades out and just being open. And then breath control, this is what I was talking about earlier, the slow emission of the breath. You know, we don't want to take a shallow breath and after three seconds of singing, we're out of breath and we have to gas up again. The more that we can regulate the breath um, and use it in an efficient way, the better we'll be. And all these exercises, of course, support that. And then breath support, energized exhalation, the musculature around the diaphragm has to sort of help, again, support that breath so that it's used in an efficient way. Okay, then we have unpitched vocal warm-ups. So, of course, some, some uh, particularly voice teachers like to breathe through straws. This is a good idea. Um, but I've just asked my singers to experiment with breathing through the nose versus through the mouth because I think there's a time for both. And we know our voices better than anybody else we meaning each singer and so I just try to get them to experiment with that um, of course hissing you can do all kinds of things pulsations uh, with the hissing and other consonants F's V's Z's Z's all kinds of things that get them thinking about the breath and the support um, that exercise I said earlier quarter rests after each group of three and that's just a great conducting exercise. It also gets the choir to onset or to make a sound exactly together and they can hear when they're sloppy and so you don't even have to sing a note and yet you're teaching them um, precision which is great. Um, sometimes I have singers that that naturally like to um, use glottals and so I will just show them, ha, 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 very soft onset. And I'll have them do that. They'll echo me. And then I'll go, oh, oh, oh. And they echo that. And I talk about what that is and what kind of sound it is and how we almost never use that unless we actually want a glottal. And then, um, and then I'll, I'll say, okay, so we don't want a breathy, ha, ha, ha. And we don't want, oh, uh, oh, uh, oh. Uh. So I ask them to do the compromise. Oh, oh. Uh. And then I have them to add a little bit of resonance. Oh, oh, oh. And they just, so I show them the extremes. And it, it works really well. So I encourage you to try that. Um, horizontal breathing. Some people swear by this. Um, you, you know, you bend at the waist. I get out of the picture frame if I do that. But uh, you've been at the waist, and you have them do some singing, take some breaths, and they'll really feel the, the of course, kind of like squatting. They feel the breath support. But then when they come back up, they sort of connect what they were doing down there to, to standing up like this, and they, they make the connection, and they, it helps them just get in touch with, with the muscles and what they need to be doing down here. Um, okay, next we energize the ear and the voice. And there's entire books with other legions of examples. Th these are just my personal favorites. Okay, energize the ear and the voice. Now we get the pitch to vocal warm-ups. Uh, it's highly recommended. There, years ago um, at a university I was at, uh, the music education faculty swore up and down that the best place to start the voice in a warm-up was way up high. So the men would jump up into falsetto and the women would be singing high E's and F's and G's. And I watched this and I tried to give it a chance and it just didn't make any sense to me. So I always start my warm-ups in the middle of the voice. I would say um, 
Sometimes I start as low as like I did before, uh, C natural. So C4 for the girls, C3 for the guys. And then sometimes I'll start as high as a G natural or an A. Uh, but I, I believe in starting in the middle. So, um, and um, I also believe, in, and these are completely out of order, okay? But I, people, we, we sing major so much, and then we sing minor and our kids sing out of tune. That's why I throw in minor all the time, and I'll give you some examples later. But um, I also throw in augmented. Sometimes I have them sing. And just talking them through. If you like the soul fish, fine. But have them sing augmented chords. You don't have to do it every day. Have them sing, um, you know, have them sing. It's important for them to know those chords and those harmonies. You can insert music theory into the rehearsal. No one's going to get upset with you. I suppose they might. But they need to know these sounds. So give them to them. Vocal sirens are terrific. I used to think they were dumb and silly, but they're so great, especially for women's voices. But And you can do all kinds of things with them. You can just have them do a free fall. The guys, you can show the passaggio, the yodel idea. And I mean, it's funny and they laugh, but, but then they kind of know, oh, that's that place I always have trouble. And the girls, you know, you can take them up and then go, oh, 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 kind of take them up three times like a roller coaster. There's all kinds of things to do, but use vocal sirens because they're so, they're so great. They're so helpful. There's an old classic exercise that just uses the basic English vowel sounds. that goes along with this and we'll have it posted on there somewhere for you that I'm going exactly in order so you know exactly where I am on this worksheet. I'm going in order. So, um, of course, the one I did earlier, you can put whatever words, vowel sounds that work for what you need. Um, let's see. Ascending. Um, graduate school we learned about different syllables and how nu and lu of course are darker so don't just pick a random syllable use use the ones that work for what you're you're after what kind of tone what kind of sound maybe your choir's e vowel epsilon eh is terrible make them warm it warm up on it <laughs> what you're hearing in rehearsal then you've got to show them and sing for your kids sing 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 for your kids they they can imitate better than anybody but if they don't have a good model it's it, it's gonna be difficult so even if you think you're a terrible singer use your voice take some lessons get better but model for your kiddos All right um, of course the three note scale is a great starter because it's simple it doesn't have a big range you can just Humming first, then switch to oo, then open up to o, and then finally ah. And it's just one of the most effective warm ups I've ever used. Sometimes uh, people like to slide in between, and it's kind of like the sirens, it's good for your singers. So sometimes I just have them. Classic music theory based warm ups. And you can go backwards. Um, in the canons that we talked about earlier, of course, we use thirds all the time. But a lot of people never use fourths. So I encourage you 
Do fa re so mi la fa ti. It's a little wider range, but they can do it. They can do it. Ask them. They just have to be asked. Um, there's great triplets. Again, pick your vowel. Va it's great. It's buoyant. It, and you just you conduct along. Um, after a while, you don't need the piano. Um, it's just a wonderful exercise. And then, what about 16 notes? So you could go... about the glottal, have them just sing, just get them going on the rhythm first, and then put the scale to it, go as slow as you need to, you can actually turn a metronome on and make it a competition, oh today we did 76, oh let's try 90 tomorrow, oh 92, and the, the class gets excited about it, how fast and clear can you sing? It's great. Um, of course, there's the old exercise where you sing a nasal vowel. Ming, 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 ming. Ming, 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 ming. I think it's more effective when you end with a resonant vowel. So, ming, 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 ming. Ming, 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 ming. Ming, 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 But whatever works for your kiddos. Uh, and before I forget this one, I found this is very helpful also. Again, I use the extremes. So when my choirs are singing vowels that are just not very tall, not very rich, not very dark or velvety, I'll pick a vowel. Then I'll say, when you sing, ah, and they'll sing, ah, and I'll sing, I'll tell them that's bright, that's too bright. Now will you sing it too dark? And I'll say, sing like an opera singer. Oh, and they'll sing, oh, and they love it. They laugh, and they look at each other, and it's great. Then I say, okay, now, too bright, too dark, what's the compromise? And I'll say, let me show you. And I sing, oh, and they make that sound. And then I tell them it's not just about this one vowel. Pick another one. About what we said earlier, eh. So, we sing, eh, and the girls are saying, eh. Too bright, and then we sing, and they'll sing. Okay, now what's the what's the middle ground? And they'll sing, and a lot of times I'll do this. So it's not eh, but it's not. We have both. We have a space and a vowel that tends to go this way, and that's what we're after, right? So use the extremes, the extremes of 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 vowel and and even pitch. I show them pitch, you know, uh, sharp, uh, and they hear it immediately. You know, they hear it immediately. So they can learn this stuff. Um, the, the old Robert Shaw interval uh, warm-ups are great. I actually kind of changed it just, just to make it more regular. So I'll usually start on G natural. I have them go. The other thing about this warm-up is you have to make sure that everything sounds like chant. It's all mental piano. Make sure it's on the breath. Don't let them sing breathy. But it has. It can't be. Because when they drop the jaw, they'll accent. And so you just make sure they sing it very on the breath, but uh, legato and chant. So no accents of any kind. Um, and you go as wide as you can. And, and they'll have trouble with the descending intervals. 
But after you do it three or four times in a row, they'll start to get it. Okay, what else do we have here? Let's see. Okay, I love to do this. So uh, I think choirs really love tuning exercises. And so I'll start them off. Basses are on a C3, tenors the G above, altos the third above that, and the sopranos on the high C. And then I just move one note around. So I'll have the tenors move up. I'll have the altos move up. And I'll have the basses move up. Again, you're teaching harmony, you're teaching chords. The sopranos come down and the basses move up. And the tenors move up. And the sopranos come down. And the altos move up. Now if that's too many, and of course some of the kids have to stay the same and not change when people around them change pitch, but then everything is a half step. Everything I just did there is a half step, and this is all written out in the handout. But I love exercises like this. Now these are four part. If you're working with elementary kids, play the harmony underneath and just give them two parts. But challenge them harmonically. Challenge them theory-wise. Challenge them to, 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 to put a square, a square nut in the square hole. You know, um, it's great. If those are too long, then do something shorter. Here's a much shorter one. Altos move down. Altos move down again. Then the tenors sit on this flat five. exercise and the whole thing just slowly moves down by half step um, but man when they sing that in tune they they get excited and you get excited of course rounds and cannons two parts four parts eight parts as many as you can do we already talked about that dynamics we already talked about that here's another exercise that involves an H it's a ha 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 so that's four H's Ha, ha, li, ha, ha, ha. And it's just. So it's. Ha, 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 ha. Ha, 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 ha. Ha, 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 Really gets them using their, their stomachs, which is what we want. There's the classic. <laughs> Buzzing. Of course, you're teaching them triplets on this. Um, there's the classic, oh, I the sky, or I love to sing. And I, all these notes are all written out in just my shorthand on this handout. So I hope that will work for you. But it's just five, eight, five, three, one. Very simple. Um, because that has such a wide range, you'll want to start at about as low as you can go so that you can actually go up a fifth or have several revolutions of that. But that's a great warm-up. Um, again, back to the music theory, Gene Ashworth Bartle with the Toronto Children's Chorus showed me this one time. It's just minor, second, major, second, minor, third, major, third, perfect, fourth, augmented, fourth, perfect, fifth. You're teaching them music theory, and they will never forget. It's like the United States, the Nifty Fifty State song, or the um, books of the Bible, or whatever. Um, they'll never forget it, and they can literally call up an interval that quick. And these were elementary kids doing this, so it's it's your your kids can do whatever they're asked to do. Um, here's one I don't hear very often, but it's terrific. This is um ah, sorry. Ah, piano skills and how I accompany these warm-ups. If you noticed at the very beginning of this workshop, I played maybe two of these. I actually played the notes with the choir, and then I immediately went to chords. Now, I grew up as a guitar player, and that's probably the reason that I do that. 
But what I've found through the years with my choirs, I think they sing more independently when I get out of their way. If your piano skills are great and you can play and all that stuff, that's great. Do it. And do it three times a week to keep it in your fingers. But I think that when choral directors play every note with their singers all the time in warm-ups, I, I think the singers can't really hear, nor, and certainly the conductor can't, what exactly are they when they sing a, a nine note scale you know i may not have the best piano skills but when i play that with them i can't hear if they're singing accurately if they're singing with precision if they're all moving to each pitch at the exact time i can't tell because i've got all this stuff going on so when i just play the chords i can actually hear the voices moving and i have found that that really allows me to focus and diagnose what they need. So I would encourage you, I just do a lot of chords, and a lot of it's just, you know, one, four, five inversions. And I, I don't, just think there's a some kind of magic here, there that really strengthens the abilities of the choir, and also my ability as far, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm not a good pianist at all, but I've learned through the years, you know, I can read lead sheets, and growing up on guitar, I had a lot to do with it, but I like to, um, I always use an octave in the left hand. For some reason, I just think that bass kind of grounds the choir. And then I just, you know, you know, you don't even have to know your four chord. One, four in the right hand, but the bass stays the same. Suspensions will help you a lot. Um, so I, that's just kind of how I got started and what has worked for me. If you're a great pianist, then that doesn't, you don't need that. But um, if you're not a great pianist and you've only got one hand down here and you can only play, fine. But, but, but get something that, that supports the choir. But I encourage you not to play every note along with them. They don't need it. Okay, what else have we got here? Oh yeah, here's a great warm-up. This is one of my favorites. So, and it's, it's, I use as much solfege as I can. I think solfege, movable dough is the way to go. So it's do, re, mi, rest, mi, fa, sol, rest, sol, la, ti, do. Is that one half note in there? Do, ti, la, la, sol, fa, fa, mi, re, do. So the rhythm is the same going up as it is coming down. There's that one half note in there and the two quarter rests. And then I just modulate. when things get short and staccato. So, of course, we'll talk about that, and I'll give them another chance. Um, but they love that warm-up. And then the last one, we go to, to turn it into an opera chorus. And they just, they just fill the room. It's a great closing warm-up. They love that. Let's see. Here's another one. This one just starts on Do. Kind of let them slide up from one to five, but just keep the vowel nice and tall. Listen for precision on each pitch. It's just a, a very grounding warm up. Um, lost my place. Let's see. Oh, here's a good one. Um, just a nice short doesn't cover a lot of range you can do it several times it's a good starting or closing warm up it's great now the one I did before Chords are just one, four, five. It's great. This next one is uh, it's not really that tricky. 
I wrote it out on here as 5, 10, 9, 8, 7, because if you're in C major, it starts on the 5. jumps up it goes up one note each time so it's but it's a lovely extension warm-up obviously you're extending up a sixth a seventh an octave and then a ninth up but it's it's a wonderful warm up. It's, it's beautiful. Um, what else do we have here? Oh yeah, I take this one really quickly. Um, I always say to them, "Shake it, go!" And they somehow, from that word "shake it," they either shake the face a little bit, which doesn't hurt anybody. But I think somehow they learn to separate the notes diaphragmatically. So they sing, you know. Messiah soloist with all the melismas. Um, and again, it's a great closer. The choirs just love it. Uh, another one that's really great, a great opener, is um, simple, right? But it just it just opens up from E O A and it's simple and quick and it gets the diaphragm. I mean, it's just, it's a great, great warm-up. Let's see. Um, you know, the old classic, five, three, four, two, three, one, two, seven, one. And you can either do one vowel on all of it, so... But then, to make it harder, you can have them switch vowels. And of course, getting them to maximize space in both of those vowels takes some convincing. And then if you want to, you can add some consonants. So, vevo, 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 something like that causes, it, it involves more work. More musculature, more work, more thought, more energy. And that's all good training for our young singers and our old singers. All right. Let's see here. I, there's an old church choir warm-up. I say that because that's where I learned it. But it's just one, two, three, four, three, two, one. And typically it's on a neutral vowel. And they just sing of its limited range you can take it forever in a day but it's a great morning warm-up you can start it really low it doesn't have a wide range like I said so it's just it, it, it's a great it's a great warm-up what can I say it gives the pianist something interesting to do if you're um, if you're bored or whatever let's see oh the Wizard of Oz warm-up oh, we, oh. from a movie that everybody knows and uh, the guys look at each other and make funny faces and act like you know crazy people from the um, from the Wizard of Oz so that's a great warm-up I offer to you um, I talked about minor earlier I typically start this in D minor but start it wherever you want it's a great warm-up I ask the altos and basses to sing and they crescendo to the top note so they sing and then the tenors and sopranos just sing a third above that. And then, of course,
course, what you get is. And then the chords, they're written in here. But it's just basically the Do minor, flat 7, flat 6, and back up. So if I sing the alto bass part, you get. that helps them learn to sing that in tune. And again, pick your vowel. The vowel really doesn't matter. Pick something that you need to work on. Um, this is a warm-up I learned during my master's at the University of Kansas. This is just, everything is va, vo, va. So it's va, vo, va. So we go from major second to triad to octave, right? So and then it just it just goes up. I think you get the idea. Um, and they can also also sing. So they'll sing. I was talking about earlier. So um, I'll actually just do boom, chunk, chunk, boom, chunk. And um, what can I say? It makes them think all the time. I keep them on their toes. Uh, they're singing a whole octave, and I listen, of course, for the high note, because that's where the pitch is going to splinter or be erratic or volatile, and so we talk about that and maybe even write on the board where our high note is, and hopefully that will move up as the school year goes by. Um, here's another great warm-up, taking some organum, uh, so I'll take a, a bass alto on the G and tenor soprano on the D. And they'll again pick your vowel. Zo I use a lot of times, Z O H, and they'll sing. school kids love this. You sing a major scale, the whole choir. I do it on solfege, but when the sopranos get to the top, they stay there. The altos go to the top, come down and stop on the G, and as you would expect, the men, the tenors come down and stop on the third, and the basses come all the way back down. And so at the end, what you have is you have your, you have your triad, or your well, your four-part triad there held, um, and it's a tuning exercise. It's great for them, so you can you can play with that. Sometimes I do something that really just gets them thinking mentally, not even about you know vocal agility or whatever. So sometimes I'll have them sing um, Silent Night, and I'll ask them to leave out beat three. So they'll have to sing. Um, and of course, with Silent Night, you have to say, okay, we're in 3 4, you know, because the 6 8 will mess with you. But then you can go, so, so let's see, um, so, and they have to be silent on the third beat. And it really gets them thinking, oh, okay, what's the meter? Where am I? Um, of course, you could do it with any song. 
You know, you could do leave out beat two on my country tis of thee. It's a mental exercise. Um, I like that because they have to jump into a different line of thought than.